A very good afternoon to all eh? brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today is the 25th February 2024, eh? Sunday class. So we'll be continuing our sharing from this book, The Heart Sutta. Eh? Uh, this is the second edition, eh? actually developed by me. And we are at page 11, subsection. 1.7 of the second Heart Sutta class. Eh? As usual, we will now compose our mind, develop the faith, Sada, Virya, then mindfully we shall commence the short puja. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Kwan Sing Pusa. Namo Kwan Sing Pusa. Namo Kwan Sing Pusa. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Milofo. Namo Milofo. Namo Milofo. Namo Pusim Pusa. Namo Pusim Pusa. Namo Pusim Pusa. Namo Tisangwang Pusa. Namo Tisangwang Pusa. Namo Tisangwang Pusa. Namo Fo Pusa. Namo Fo Pusa. Namo Fo Pusa. Arahang Sama Sam Buddha Bagawa. Buddhang Bagawantang Abiwa Demi. Suaka to bagawata damo damang namasami Supatipano bagawato sao kesango sanghang namami Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Bhattang saranang gachami, Dhammang saranang gachami, Sanghang saranang gachami, Dhatiyampi bhattang saranang gachami, Dhatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami, Dhatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami, Tatiyampi bedang saranang gachami, Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami, Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami, Panati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami Adina dana veramani sikha padang samadhyami Kami sumicha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami Mosawada Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sura Meraya Maja Pamadatana Veramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Sadhu 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 Okay, let's pay respect to the person. Bedang Pujemi Damang Pujemi Sanghang Pujemi Okay, after a break of almost 
uh, two weeks uh. oh more than two weeks I think uh. so we are back to our Heart Sutta class uh, Sunday so anyway I will uh, maybe go back a little bit and give you all the background behind before we continue uh, go to the that page uh, subsection 1.6 uh, page 11 uh, I go back with 1 1.6 uh. so earlier on actually when we were at this heart sutta class number two uh, we started off with the important uh, Dhammapada verses uh, words of wisdom of the Buddha under subsection 1.3 one point one which you had done earlier on is the ten parameters, then the equivalent six perfection of the Maya tradition, then one point three are the word of wisdom of the Buddha, where we discuss about Dhammapada verse one, verse two, and the famous advice of the Buddha, Dhammapada verse one eight three. Followed by the important Dhammapada verses 21, 22, 23 on heedfulness or Apama, Apamada Vagas. Yeah? Means all the important Dhammapada verses on heedfulness. And we move on to the final advice of the Buddha before his Parinibbana. He actually reminded the monks, he said, Apa Madena Sampadita means you have to strive on with heedfulness, otherwise, you will never realize the enlightenment. Yeah. Strive on with heedfulness, the meaning is very deep. You must develop heedfulness before you can strive on. So, there is a saying under Dhammapada verse 21, he said, Heedfulness is the path to the deathless, whereas heedlessness is the path to the dead. <coughs> the heedless are as if dead. So, this Dhammapada verse 21 is very important. You need heedfulness. So, the heedful never die, means they will have the eternal life. The spiritual life, then they can end birth and death. That's why the word the heedful never die, it means there is no more rebirth for them after that. Yeah. Then the heedless are as if dead spiritually, it means you don't stand a chance for gaining enlightenment, and that is very obvious. That's why the emphasis on is on heedfulness. Then subsection 1.5, we move on to the, five, uh, the final summary of the first noble truth of Dukkha. So under the final summary, the Buddha summary, in short, it is due to your attachment or grasping or clinging to the five grasping aggregate, Upadana Khandas, that I call Dukkha. So all this were discussed. Then we move on to subsection 1.6, which is on the seven factors of enlightenment. So this one again, eh, we go back to the notes now, 1.6. The seven factors of enlightenment are Sata, Bhujanga. Sata is seven. Bhujangas are the enlightenment factors. The meaning is, when you have these mind states, they are factors of enlightenment. It can bring forth enlightenment in the here and the now. And very obviously, the first factor of enlightenment is sati or mindfulness. So this first factor of enlightenment is very vital, very important, and it links directly with apamada or heedfulness. Without sati, you cannot be heedful. That's why sati is most important. Sati is mindfulness. 
or awareness before the knowing. This is your silent mind, your true mind. So, sati, you need to develop it first. Then once you develop it, the second factor of enlightenment can follow. So, sati or mindfulness is the first factor of enlightenment followed by the investigation of Dhamma or Dhamma Vichaya as the second factor of enlightenment. Because without sati, one cannot develop the investigative Dhamma. And without sati, one cannot be heedful or ever mindful, leading to heedfulness. Hence, one cannot investigate the Dhamma. That is the reason why sati or heedfulness is very important, for sati is life. Because the heedless are as if they, if there is no sati, there is no heedfulness. Without heedfulness, you are as if they. That's why sati is lying. Sati can bring about heedfulness. And sati can enable you to see things as they are, to be with the moment without thought. Your pure seeing or direct seeing is not complicated by the thought process or not affected by the thought process. Means your memories, your views, your opinion, your conditioning, your belief system created by thought does not interfere with what you see. You can be with the moment in pure awareness or sati to be aware, that's it. Yeah. To understand what is going on in life instead of being lost in thought, preoccupied with your thinking, leading to heedless proliferation of thought process. Then with sati, one can investigate the Dhamma and if it's the truth, then this Dhamma will stand up to investigation, thereby giving us the strong faith in the Buddha and his teaching. For example, Dhammapada verse 1 and 2. If we investigate into it, we realize that the Buddha's words are so true. Dhammapada verse 1, without heedfulness, leads to suffering. Whereas Dhammapada verse 2, when you develop heedfulness, you act, speak, and think with a wholesome mind, free of the evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. Then you realize happiness follow you, like your shadow that never leaves you. So all this can be investigated upon. Yeah. So what are evil roots? Roots of all evil. When they arise in your heart, they make you evil. That's why these three evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion need to be understood, investigated upon, and you need mindfulness to be aware of them. Then you can investigate, you can check. This is how you cultivate. Then the next spiritual faculty is virya or spiritual zeal. It will arise thereby enabling one to cultivate the Dhamma according to the Buddha's advice. So sati will then stabilize. Where this virya is a driving force, it's a spiritual zeal of tenacity to walk this way after developing the faith, after Dhamma investigation, after understanding how special the Buddha is, how wise the Buddha is, and how beautiful the teaching is. Yeah. And because of that, your faith in his teaching and in him become unshakable. That's why that will drive you to develop virya, to cultivate. And to cultivate is to stabilize the sati. So once the teeth stabilize, you will experience the fifth factor of enlightenment, which is pity or spiritual joy. 
and this is the fourth enlightenment factor. Once PT is stabilized and become more refined, it will accumulate into paucity or tranquility of mind, stillness of mind. And this is the fifth enlightenment factor. And this paucity, tranquility or stillness of mind is our true mind. The mind that has no thought, nothing. It's just tranquil and still. And this is the mind that is in sati. Without sati, stable, paucity cannot come to be. So when sati is stabilized, it finally accumulates into paucity or tranquility of mind and stillness of mind. With paucity, you can develop more and more stability of it then the mind accumulate into samadhi so when paucity is very stable the mind transform into samadhi samadhi is a stable collected and unwavering mind and this is the sixth factor of enlightenment and this will enable one to see things as they are. Means when you are in this silent inner awareness with the stability of samadhi, at every moment of sense experience, the mind does not stir or waver. It does not move into reality of like and dislike. The conditioning from the mundane mind does not come in and interfere because that samadhi make your mind collected and unwavering. And because of that, one can see things as they are without the interference from one's accumulated knowledge, memory, which is full of our views, opinion, conditioning, belief system, phobia, insecurity, sorrow, lamentation, etc. All these are negativity of mind state with the evil roots. And when all those doesn't come in and interfere, then we can actually awaken and develop the wisdom to understand who we are, what we are, and how we function as a human being. How the mundane mind through delusion get itself entangled with all the creation of thought. So all this is what the factors of enlightenment means. Without the factors of enlightenment, you cannot awaken. Then finally, with samadhi, you can see things as they are insight into phenomena and awaken to the three universal characteristics of Anichang, Dukkang, Anatta, you can develop the wisdom behind. You can see the Paticca Sampada, how you function as a human being, how your mind operates and develop all the entanglement to delusion. And all this will give rise to what we call Panya. Panya is also a spiritual faculty, the last of the five spiritual faculty. Once Panya arises, together with Samadhi, it will transform the mind into equanimity, which is the seven factors of enlightenment, the last of the factors of enlightenment. So this one, in Pali, they call it Upeka, or the English equivalent is equanimity of mind, born of wisdom. Yeah. Of course, initially you need the samadhi before the wisdom sets in. To see things as they are, to insight the phenomena and to awaken. Then once the wisdom arrives, samadhi together with wisdom will make the mind equanimous. That's how the seven 
or last factor of enlightenment arise. We call it equanimity or upeka. Then there's a note. Eh? Samadhi equals a, a stable, collected, and unwavering, unwavering mind that does not waver at the moment of sense experience while in the midst of life. So this is the meaning of daily mindfulness. Once your daily mindfulness stabilize and develop the ability to have samadhi, then this samadhi can enable one to awaken. Okay, then now we continue. Huh? 1.7. Yeah. So 1.7 is the three universal characteristics. The Pali words of these three universal characteristics are anichang, dukkang, and anatta, or anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Anicca means the universal characteristic of change, impermanence. <coughs> If we look at life, we look at existence, we look at the phenomenal world, our existential world, we realize that everything that arises within the conditioned world, they are all dependent, originating, condition arising, causal phenomena, not a permanent, unchanging entity that remains forever. And because of that, these universal characteristics of anicca or impermanent become a universal characteristic and it is very clear take for example our human body and mind if you are mindful you can be aware within you realize this human being is not what you think it's not a permanent unchanging entity. It is just a phenomenon sustained by causes and conditions. And what are the causes and conditions behind? If you are mindful, if you are contemplated, reflected, and develop the inner awareness long enough to realize it, then you will come to understand that you have a consciousness trapped inside. You have a physical body with all the senses to allow you to make contact with the mind to trigger off their respective sense of consciousness. Then the fire aggregate of form and mind within us, which is Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana. They are always in a state of flux within us. So first of all, we just silent our mind, completely develop the silent mind or sati within. Then you will detect many things. The first thing you normally detect is your own powers of life or the vibration within your own body. So this vibration, this pulse, for those who can stay at the heart and be aware of the pulse of life, especially your heartbeat, you will come to know that it's continuously arising and passing away. The pulse arise and pass away. That's why it's impermanent. It come and it go. Then when you do anapanasati through mindfulness of the in and out breath, you also come to know your breath moves in and out unceasingly. So everything within you, your feeling, they arise and they pass away. Your thought process is the same. Sankara activity perception arise and pass away everything is in a state of flux then consciousness also same they arise and pass away one moment you are conscious of seeing next moment you are conscious of hearing smell taste tactile and the thought process 
There are all the various types of mind states of Sankara activity. They are in a state of flux, thereby witnessing these universal characteristics of change or anicca very clearly. Then not only that, when you are sensitive, you realize every part of your body, all the cells, everything, they are ever transforming. Some are growing, some are aging, some are dying. So the continuous renewal of cells, bloods, and emission of the uh, effluence or waste through our sweat, through our gases, through our excretion, through our nasal, uh, what they call uh, discharge. Uh, all the aperture within our human body, the eye, is the same. They also discharge all the unwanted uh, effluent or sometimes it's toxin. Then through sweat, we also discharge them. And there is this constant exchange and renewal of what they call uh, cell activity. Through the food we eat, the water we drink, the prajna that we draw from nature, all this is what life, existence, is all about, the biological order. So we need all this to nourish ourselves, to sustain ourselves, to actually maintain the growth of this so-called human form or our human body. And all these are kept in the phenomenal movement through the sustaining activity. When the causes and conditions they support, their sustaining are there, they continue to exist. When any of the three that sustain all this cease to be, then that so-called human being or form and mind will cease to be, and they call it dead. But when you are mindful, aware, cultivating, you will come to a very clear understanding that nothing dies, no one dies. What is death? Death is just a separation of the consciousness from the form, where there is no more condition for its sustaining. And what are the three things that sustain life within our human form and mind? Of course, it's very obvious. We need a functional physical body with all the organs in proper functioning condition. In fact, all the vital organs like the heart, the spinal cord, the liver, the spleen, everything, all the parts that comes together that animate this physical body. If any of the vital organs are affected, if any of the temperature that is required to sustain life is affected, it can trigger off what they call the collapse of the physical system leading to the collapse of the so-called human body and mind leading to what we call death. So all this, when you are mindful and when you are aware, you develop sensitivity to be aware and to understand what is going on. Then you will see clearly the universal characteristics of impermanent within. Then you will also come to an understanding that it is all supported by condition. This phenomenon of a human being is all sustained by condition. And the three main conditions are, just now I explained only the first one, 
The first one is the physical body in functional condition. The second one is the life force. The life force is what we call the karmic force. The karmic force. So this life force is from our karmic force. The karmic force that come to us through our karmic sustainer, or we call it the karmic life force that actually give us life. So it come as the powers of life to pump our heart through the heartbeat. This powers of life, which is the karmic force, or we call it the supportive karma, the karmic entity that sustain the life force, is the one that powers the heart to create all the heartbeat and all the vibration within our body. This is to help us send the blood around. And the blood through the heart is a purification chamber, of course, together with the lungs and everything that draws in the oxygen, the prajna, the exchange. Then through this, it nourishes all your organs your various, uh, what they call bodily uh, parts, like the brains, your other organs, the eye, and all these are sustained to blood. Then the last one is, of course, the consciousness. If there is con no consciousness trapped inside, then you cannot give rise to what they call the respective sense of consciousness. The physical body is important because it goes through the process of growth. Of course, initially it's birth. From birth, it will experience the growth process. Then after you reach certain age, you no longer grow your growth cell all will become like reach the peak. Then they call it the aging phase where the growth hormone no more. That's why this physical body of ours is of the nature to go through old age, sickness, and death. So getting old is a nature's phenomenon. Getting sick also is a nature's phenomenon. That's why in our five daily contemplation, the Buddha advises us to contemplate. This body of ours is of the nature to grow old, get sick and die. For he has not gone beyond old age, sickness and death. But this one goes the way of nature. It's not a permanent unchanging entity. It does not belong to you. So all this, you can see them and come to a great awakening or realization when you are mindful. Then the universal characteristics of change is everywhere, every moment, every instant, within your own form and mind, like I explained just now. The pulse of life, the vibration, the constant movement of the breath, then all the sustaining activity within our form and mind. Then our mind, the way we feel things, perceive things, they are all in a state of flux. Feeling come and go. Perception come and go. Activity of mind, mind states, the thought process, the emotion, the whatever sensation, they come and they go. If their consciousness is the same, they arise and they pass away. Every moment of consciousness may be different. So through all this, you start to see and realize a very important realization that matches with what the Buddha meant. The Buddha said the five aggregates of form and mind, they are impermanent. You attach and cling. You suffer. 
And because they are impermanent, it's not a permanent, unchanging entity, that's why it's anatta. Yeah. So all this will become clear. Like I always share with you all. Feeling come and go, you didn't die. So how can feeling be you? If feeling is you, when pleasant feeling arise, and pass away and become unpleasant feeling, then you should die with that feeling. Isn't it? But how come feeling transform, come and go, you didn't die? Likewise, perception arise and pass away, you didn't die. Sankara activity, or the mind state, they arise and they pass away, you didn't die. Consciousness arise and pass away, you didn't die. So how can they be you? If they are not you, the next inquiry is, why did they arise in you? Then who are you? What are you? That's why you will be able to investigate and zoom into all this understanding and realize that the five aggregates of form and mind, they are empty, not real, subject to the universal characteristics of change, anicham. And because it's anicham, following nature's law, you cannot grasp and cling and want things your way. If you cling, attach and want things your way, you suffer. That's why the Buddha is so wise, the five daily contemplation, the first three. You want your body to be forever young, don't get old, don't get sick and don't die. It's impossible. Where this physical body goes the way of nature, you have no control. It will go through that process. And because of that, if you attach, you cling, grasp, and hold on to things, wanting things your way, which is not nature's way, you develop unnecessary suffering, leading to all the misery, the entanglement. Likewise, the fourth daily contemplation is the same, separation. Separation is a reality because of the universal characteristics of change. Everything is of the nature to transform, to change in a state of flux. So separation is a reality. When condition is such, things will arise. When condition cease to be, things will cease to be. They come and they go. They never belong to you. Yet you yourself also don't exist. How can you own things and have things? Like what the Buddha said, my wealth, my children, my property, my whatever, reputation, everything. These only the fools, the foolish, the men. For their very body also don't belong to him. Wherein son, wherein wealth, wherein property, and all those things. So this understanding will awaken the individual. It will root out the avijja, the ignorant, to awaken the living things. And without sati, you cannot see all this, you cannot understand all this. That's why the universal characteristics of impermanent anicca is everywhere. Not only within our physical body. You look at everything that arises within the universe, our existential world. You don't need a God to create all this. They arise to nature's condition. When there are causes and conditions, they arise, they evolve. And they continue with their life cycle and process, even the season of the years, the weather, the nature, the plants, the animals, the fishes, the ocean, the continent. Everything within nature, they operate following nature's law. 
they are all dependent originating condition arising causal phenomena. That's why the Buddha is so wise. He said, whatever that arise, there are causes and conditions behind. And these causes and conditions, you can deduce them through his teaching. He teaches all us very beautiful essential dhamma. The next essential dhamma that we are going to study after 1.7 is, of course, 1.8, the five universal law or order of nature. Uh, but before I go to that, I have to finish off the second universal characteristic and third universal characteristic. So now I will take you back to the understanding of these three universal characteristics of nature. How do we develop understanding of anichang, tukang, and anatta? So as I have explained just now, everything within our form and mind, within nature, within our consciousness, they are experiencing a state of change or flux. They arise and pass away dependent on other things. That's why they exhibit the law of dependent origination, Paticca Samuppada. And within all these changes, there are, according to the Buddha, nature's condition governing them. And the Buddha realizes the five universal order of nature. And he defined them very clearly under 1.8. Huh? The first two are scientific law, Uttuniyama, or physical law of nature followed by bija niyama, or biological order of nature. So these two laws, all physical things and biological things, they follow these two laws. Like our human body, or the, uh, what they call, uh, organic matter thing, like the plants, the fishes, or whatever, they follow biological order. But all the other elements, they follow physical law physical order. That's why our physical body being element and it also organic in nature, it will go the way of nature following this two law. So everything that arises within the condition world, they have their causes and conditions behind. That's the reason why the Buddha said whatever arises there are causes and conditions behind. So when causes and conditions continue to sustain its existence, it exists. Then when causes and conditions cease to be, it ceases to be. That's why we see the impermanent universal characteristics of change. Because everything is in a state of flux, dependent originating condition arising, cause of phenomena. It's not a permanent unchanging entity by itself. And they follow this set of universal order. So the first two I've gone through, Uttuniyama and Bijaniyama, then there are three more spiritual law. These three spiritual law are very powerful. They are the law of Kama, Kama Niyama, the law of mind, Chitta Niyama, and the law of Dhamma or truth, Dhamma Niyama. <coughs> All these are the spiritual law as taught by the Buddha. Just like the scientists, when they understood the first two physical law of nature, Uttuniyama and Bijana, they actually advanced very fast. They developed a lot of progress, advancement in knowledge, technology, understanding, and even nowadays transforming into artificial intelligence, information technology, etc., etc. So likewise, those who meditate, develop the spiritual understanding, they will realize and understand the three spiritual laws that governs life and existence. 
Kama Niyama, Chitta Niyama, and Dhamma Niyama. So Kama Niyama is about the law of Kama, the fifth daily contemplation. Then when you truly understand the law of Kama, we are born our Kama, heir to our Kama, condition is supportable of Kama. We are what we are because of Kama. Then we know Kama is very important. That's why we were determined to take care of Kama. And not only that, we will also come to know because there is this karmic law. They call it the moral causation of cause and effect. Dhammapada verse 1 and 2 is based on this right view with regards to the law of karma. The Buddha realized the three evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion are the culprit born of delusion that condition negativity of karma and suffering. That's why through this understanding, he came out with the karmic law. He said, you reap what you sow, you plant the seed of evil, you become evil, you reap the fruit of evil. You plant the seed of wholesomeness, you will reap the fruit of wholesomeness. And this is a very important basic understanding of life. If you want to have the good life, you have to avoid all evil. You could. Avoiding all evil is to avoid planting the seed of evil. Avoiding all the mental states that have the evil intention of greed, hatred, and delusion. Greed is not only greediness. All your selfish intent are also greed. All your craving, attachment, clinging, grasping, views and opinion, holding on to things, they are all your greed, the evil of greed. Then all of your anger, hatred, jealousy, unhappiness, negativity of my state, they constitute the evil roots of hatred. Then all of your fear, worry, anxiety, sorrow and lamentation, your doubt, they constitute the evil root of delusion. When you grasp and cling, believing you are real, you exist, that is self-delusion, sakayaniti. And because of that, you develop fear, worry, anxiety, sorrow, and lamentation. So all these are the evil roots. So when you develop understanding of them, then you are mindful of them, then you can avoid Dhammapada verse 1 and develop Dhammapada verse 2 to change the way you live your life. Then you will have the good life. Having the good karma, Avoiding all the evil can only give you certain amount of good merits and wholesomeness. But when it comes to living life, there are other things that you need to take care of, like the wisdom, the understanding of all the essential dhamma that the Buddha has taught us to enable us to free our mind, liberate our mind from suffering. That's why we need to meditate, the third advice of the Buddha. We need to meditate to purify our mind so that we develop the wisdom to free. So only wisdom free. So meditation is not about developing special ability or psychic ability and all those things, or fantastic meditative mind state. No. The main intent is wisdom, to awaken, to realize the truth, to be free from delusion, to be free from attachment, clinging, grasping, and suffering. So that is the intent. So law of karma alone can bring forth so much understanding. The advice of the Buddha came from this law of karma. 
And when you understand the law of karma, you understand the moral causation, you understand life, you know how to live life, and you know how to actually develop the understanding of living the noble life, the proper, appropriate life of a true living being. You're no longer heedless. Then the next one is Chitta Niyama. Chitta Niyama is the law of mind, how we function as a human being, how the law of Paticca Samupada, Avijja Pachya Sankara, Sankara Pachya Vijnana, Vijnana Pachya Namaru, Namarupa, etc., etc., until the final link, the whole mass of suffering. So all this, you need mindfulness to be aware of all this activity of mind, all the link that create all the entanglement in our life. Then when we are mindful, silent, aware, we can see how the mundane mind still react to sense experience and to their own delusion got themselves entangled with all the unnecessary suffering and misery. So all this, when you see them, you can develop the wisdom to actually reverse them, retrospectively reverse them. That's why meditation is very important. The third way and the fourth way to overcome wrong thought, unwholesome thought, unwholesome speech and unwholesome action. The third way is of course to develop mindfulness, to be aware and to see how they cease. And when you know how they cease, then you know anger is not you. The evil roots of hatred is not you. The evil roots of craving, greed, delusion, they are not you. They come and they go. When you are just aware, it ceases to be. And you didn't die, which means they are not intrinsic within you. If they are not intrinsic within you, then why did you deludedly allow that delusion to manifest? Why did you constantly tell yourself, I still have anger, I still have greed, I still have delusion? This is me, this is I, therefore all this can be mine. All these are delusions. So when you develop the third way well, you realize everything ceases when you are just aware. So awareness is the basis of the true understanding of that true mind, your pure intrinsic nature, free of all the mind state created by the mundane thinking or mundane mind. All these are not intrinsic within your nature which means they are all dependent, originating, condition arising, cause of no, which means they are impermanent. You attach, clean, you suffer. And because they are impermanent, it's not a permanent and changing entity that you can grasp onto, cling onto, hold onto, and say, this is me, this is I. That's why all this will bring forth the clear understanding of the anatta nature, the impermanent nature, the suffering, universal characteristic nature. The three characteristics all become very clear. Then the third spiritual law is the Dhamma Niyama, or the essential Dhamma of the Buddha, the law of truth or Dhamma as taught by the Buddha. Everything that he has taught us, the five spiritual faculty, the five mental hindrances, Seven factors of enlightenment, Noble Eightfold Path, including all the other essential Dhamma of the three evil roots, the four Brahma Vihara, eh? and all the other teachings. They constitute this final truth that are not included in the first two. Law of karma and law of mind. So Dhamma, you can also say, is truth or nature. Nature's truth. Nature's order. Uh, or Dhamma, 
Niyama, the law of truth. So all this are very important understanding. Then here I mention understanding these three spiritual law that governs all of life and existence. Bring it down a bit. So go on, huh? will give rise to these three important right views as taught by the Buddha in his Noble Eightfold Path. That is, right view with regards to Law of Karma, which I have already explained. Eh? Now it's a revision. Eh? That is, you reap what you sow, do good because good, do evil because evil. And you are born of your karma, heir to your karma, conditioned and supported by your karma, and you are what you are because of your karma, etc. So knowing this, you will know how to make the correct determination to live your life. Like I always say, each and every one of us, we own uh, sorry, each and every one of us, we hold the key to our own destiny. Okay? To be happy or to be unhappy is our choice. If we choose to be happy, to have the good life, then why are we not happy? Does it mean most people don't know how to choose? No, because they don't have this teaching, they don't have this understanding. That's why they become heedless and they choose wrongly. Actually, they never choose. They go back to their heedless way, following karma, getting entangled with karma. But when you develop the understanding of the teaching, you awaken from the delusion, then you realize you have a choice. You can choose how you want to live your life. If you choose to have the good life, choose to be happy, then you will be able to realize that. Because this is part and parcel of the teaching. When you understand the teaching, you will know how to choose. And you will choose correctly, appropriately. So that choice is based on understanding, not based on views, opinion, conditioning, and delusion. So making the right choice or understanding based on understanding is very important. And because of that, this law of karma will give rise to all the teaching that the Buddha has come out with. His Dhammapada verse 183, the advice of the Buddha to avoid all evil to go and purify the mind, that is to take care of karma. But if karma plays such a great role in our life, that is, we are born of it, heir to it, conditioned and supported by it. And we are what we are because of it. So we need to take care of karma, to take care of our life, to take care of our karmic nature, so that whenever we arise, we will have the support of this good karmic nature, the law of karma, to protect us, to guide us, and to condition the appropriate good condition for us to have the good life and good nature within. Then the law of mind, this will refer to the Paticca Samopada or the dwelling, the law of dependent origination. When you understand the dwelling, you understand how you develop mental entanglement. Whereas the law of the mind is about the mind, how through delusion you attach, cling, grasp, hold, stir, and react to certain experience and entangle yourself. So when you know how this operates, then you will develop right view to disengage all this delusion. Avijja is wrong view, wrong understanding, ignorance. That's why it creates Sankara activity. The enlightened being they seldom think, they hardly think. They only make use of the thought process when there is a need to arise, to help people, to develop wholesomeness, to share. Otherwise, their mind is always tranquil, still, in pure awareness, with that nature within. 
So all this understanding are very important. Yeah. So I read through the last paragraph again. Understanding this three great spiritual law is likened. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish the law of Dhamma. The law of Dhamma means the Four Noble Truths and its three turning, the five ideas of form and mind, the five spiritual faculty, etc. Huh? All the essential Dhamma. Yeah. That understanding this three great spiritual law is likened to understanding the secret of life, giving rise to the wisdom to enable us to truly live life. Having this right view will lead to the understanding of non-delusion, non-attachment, non-grasping, and non-clinging, etc. Hence, free and liberating our mind from all suffering. Then, this Panchaniyama can also be explained by the four aspects of Dhamma or nature as taught by Ajahn Buddha Dasa. According to Ajahn Buddha Dasa, who is also the teacher of Ajahn Yantra, my teacher, he said, first aspect of this Panchaniyama is, he said, there is nature, the four aspects of nature. First, there is nature, he said. Then, second aspect is, there are laws that govern nature. So, what are the laws? The Panchaniyamas. Then the third aspect is, he also realized, there is a right duty that one must perform towards this law of nature, or laws that governs nature. Means you must do your right duty. That's why my teacher, Achayantra, also always say this famous sentence. He said, right duty is right dhamma, or right tamak. So what is right duty? According to the salutation, to the Sangha, under our chanting, there are four qualities of the disciple of the Buddha. Yeah. So when we chant, the first one is Supatipano Bhagavato Savaka Sangha. Of right conduct is the uh, nature of the disciple of the Buddha. Yeah. The second one is Ujupatipano, is of upright conduct. First one is of good conduct, upright conduct. Then Nyaya Patipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango, means of wise conduct, is the disciple of the Buddha. Then the last one is Samiji Patipano Bhagavato Savaka Sango. This Samiji is the of right duty is the disciple of the Buddha. So this right duty is what the Buddha referred to. That's why Achan, Buddha Dasa, and Achan Yantra, they also know there is this right duty that one must perform towards this nature's law. Even the scientists are not exempted. If you go against the first two nature's law within the scientific law, of Uttaniyama and Bijaniyama, they will get themselves into trouble too. That's why when they progress without taking into consideration the full understanding, <coughs> they will give rise to negative effect. That's how pollution sets in. That's how overdevelopment causes a lot of karmic repercussion from nature. The nature's law, they will actually cause the karmic retribution. So, just take for example, eh, some of this happening, when we do a lot of development, then we fail to take care of the pollution that comes with it, like industrialization. So now the world is paying a high cost for pollution due to what they call industrialization. Then agricultural revolution also same. We pay a very high cost for contaminating our environment with all the 
uh, fertilizer and all those things. And some of this fertilizer, they also incorporate what they call uh, to destroy the what they call uh, all those that attack your farm product. One you call it huh? uh, pesticide. Uh, all the pests. Uh, they come out with all the very toxic type of pesticide. You know, that actually trigger all the environment degradation. That's why a lot of products from Cameron Highland, the overusage of pesticide, they got banned from entering Singapore and many places. Because they use pesticide uh, to the extent that it's been overdone. That they want to project a product or their agricultural produce, fruits and vegetables as beautiful because they don't decay on because of the pesticide. So nowadays a lot of uh, housewives they become smart already. They see uh, no decay when they don't want to buy it. They know excessive use of pesticide. That's why they buy organic one. Uh, organic one is they don't use pesticide. They only use some form of uh, meno, uh, meno or what we call fertilizer allowable type. So all these are the result. Even in engineering is the same. When we assess it development, we do a lot of earth work, transforming forests into residential houses or property or industrial building or industrial property. So through this, we create a lot of soil erosion. We damage a lot of uh, green and nature. And because of that, it triggers off repercussion. So this is not understanding the full scope of the nature's law that governs life and existence. So when you work with half-big understanding, the retribution will hit back. Then sometimes it's a combination of human consciousness when there is too much of this hatred, anger, war, and uh, misunderstanding among the human consciousness. Like the recent years and the past 10 to 24 years. The great tsunami that was triggered on is actually from the human consciousness. Uh, then it tie out with the physical law. So the fiscal law together with the karmic law, they actually trigger the great tsunami. That's why those who are supposed to die, they will die. Those not supposed to die, they won't die. Uh, and it's one of the ways to wipe off those uh, deluded consciousness. And sometimes it's because of all this fighting and all those things. War need to happen, riot need to happen. And through this, they wipe off all the consciousness that are not conducive. So these are nature's way of reacting. We call it retribution from nature. So man and nature is one. If we don't live in harmony with nature, if we destroy nature, nature destroys us because we are one with nature. That's why all of nature is one, all our existence is one. There must be harmony established. That's why whatever that is rigid without harmony, there is not the Dhamma. So all these are very important understanding. Yeah? We go back to 1.7. Okay, so I finish off the 1.7. Yeah? So the first universal characteristic I've explained uh, in detail enough already. Yeah? So because of our condition world, our existential world, we call it the condition arising world. Everything within the condition world, they are dependent originating condition arising cause of phenomena in a state of flux, ever changing ever evolving.
they come and they go, they come and they go. There is no reality, only mighty nature rolling by. So this universal characteristic of change governed by the Panchayanayama is very clear. So if we want thing our way, which is not nature's way, when you lack wisdom, what happens? It brings about delusion, sakadity, ignorance. Then if a condition want to grasp, cling and hold on to things, and one thing is your way, which is not nature's way, that's how suffering arises. When you cannot get what you want, when things don't go your way, when you don't have the wisdom to comprehend the first noble truth reality of all a sickness and death, birth, separation, when you are with people whom you don't like, when things don't go your way, when your expectations in life are not met. In short, it's due to your Sakaya Didi that condition you to grasp and cling on to the fire aggregate of form and mind, thinking that is you, thinking that is real, that trigger of suffering. So this universal characteristic of suffering, you can see them very clearly. When your craving, grasping and clinging arise through delusion, then it will trigger off all this unnecessary suffering. That's why you realize the evil root came from delusion. Your selfishness, your covetousness, your what they call uh, possessiveness, your greed, your desire, your craving, all this, they arise to Sakariti, self-delusion. Then also your anger, your hatred, your envy, your jealousy, your deep resentment, your negativity of mind state. Yeah. All this, they arise to delusion. So because of delusion, ignorance, it trigger off suffering. So all this understanding points towards the universal characteristics of Dukkha. Without wisdom, you cannot free, you cannot liberate your mind. You will deludedly grasp, cling, hold and entangle yourself more and more, more and more, more and more. That's why we need to develop mindfulness, peacefulness, to see all this clearly and to awaken to the universal characteristics of impermanent leading to suffering when you don't have the understanding. And because it's impermanent, how can it be a permanent unchanging entity that you can cling onto, grasp onto and say, this is me, this is I. Therefore, all this can be mine. It's definitely a delusion. And because it's a delusion, that's why the Buddha teach the universal characteristic of Anatta. Of course, the Theravada tradition tend to define Anatta as non-self, not a permanent unchanging entity, which is correct in that sense. But Anatta is not limited to non-self alone. If it's not a permanent unchanging entity, definitely it's not you, it's not me, non-self. But there is another deeper meaning within anatta. Anatta means not real, not what you think, not a permanent unchanging entity that you can like grasp onto, cling onto, hold onto, and develop all the corresponding delusion. The deeper meaning of anatta is very important. It's empty nature of existence. If everything is dependent originating, condition arising, cause of phenomena, they arise and they pass away. Like my teacher said, mighty nature rolling by. He know you, he know me. Then, how real can life be? And like 
our previous Thursday class discussion. Of all the three periods of time, past, present, and future, which is the reality? Of course, we come to know the present moment is the only reality and the highest in life. But how stable is the present moment? Through mindfulness, we are aware. Split second is dead and gone. Split second is dead and gone. Dead and gone. Every moment it arrives and passes away so fast, so transient. And that is the only reality in life. So how real can life be? You cannot deny whatever happens since birth until now. All this like civilization, the evolution of consciousness, society, the world and all those things, even planets and whatever civilization. You cannot deny that they happened before. But how real is it? Even our own life since birth until now, how real is it? Is it real? We cannot deny that it occurred before, but is it real? Because at this very moment, if there is no thought, they don't exist, understand? If there is no thought to hold on to what happened, the past is already gone, no reality, dead and gone. No history also. History also need man to memory to recall them. So as real as it can be, we can only recall them through our thought process. That's why I like the Mandarin song, Wang Si Zi Nen Hui Wei. Everything that happened, we can only recall through memory. So how real can life be? And uh, that is the bigger meaning, the bigger picture of anatta. Anatta is not only non-self, it means empty nature of existence, no reality, not what you think. So don't be foolish, don't grasp and don't cling. But there is such thing as life, existence, like I explained. Uh, so when you go through life, go through existence, there are existential dhamma that you need to take care, like your right duty and all those things. Don't ignore them. But when it comes to the unconditioned dhamma understanding, the wisdom part, then all this empty nature, they manifest very clearly. This will prevent you from being entangled while living life within the conditioned world. That's why the condition, the mind, the unconditioned, the mind, they must be understood side by side. For you to understand life and for you to live life. Okay? So now I think we will stop here. Huh? What's the time now? So we stop at 1.8. The next session will be 1.9. Yeah? I mark this page. Then you can have your 45 minutes of meditation, eh? awareness-based meditation. Okay, good. Okay, you all can slowly, mindfully, come out of meditation. Eh? Try to maintain whatever inner peace in the calmness and in the awareness that you have developed for as long as you can. Eh? These are the mind state that you need eh? to develop the heedfulness in the midst of life. Eh? Okay. So now we will continue your second session, which is meditation reporting, eh? followed by whatever question that you may have. Eh? Uh, meditation is based on the awareness-based meditation that we have taught you. Huh? And if you have any question regarding the meditation, you can actually come in and ask the question. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ito Koga, you are Mrs. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And all time Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 
uh, what shall I talk about? Uh, because Valtteri talk so much. Uh, yeah, today so is today when well. the uh, on the three universal characteristic, uh, followed by the five panchaniyamas. Uh, so it's like a revision for most of you. Uh, then maybe uh, for some who are new, uh, it is some uh, sharing that you might. Uh, like to uh, reflect on uh, or contemplate into. Uh, these are the initial teachings that the Buddha taught uh, based on the essential Dhamma that he has given us. Uh, I started off with the 10 perfection, then after that we move on to the uh, 6 perfection by this uh, Mahayana. Then after that is all on the uh, Dhammapada verses, uh, verse one, verse two, verse one eight three, Dhammapada verse twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. Then after that is on the importance of mindfulness. Then we come back to today's topic on the three universal characteristic. Then the five pancha niyamas. So these are the basic uh, essential teachings of the Buddha when he started the Four Noble Truths when his three turning then he continued with the essential Dhamma. So for you, Pujin, you want to uh, share anything you can. <coughs> it's just an like, open topic. Uh, uh. Uh, brother, why not I share about my daily life? Uh, ah, yeah, daily life. Daily life. Yes. Because yeah. that, that will talk about the sati, the seven factors of the life. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sati and Dhamma Vichaya. Yeah, yeah, Dhamma investigation. How, how that happens in my daily life. Okay? Oh, good. Uh, that will be good. Yes. Okay. But prior to that, for new people, just want to remind that, that you know, we need to like uh, develop sati first uh, before we can actually yeah. able to that one use is it. Most important. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> able to use it um, in the daily life, you know, that you yeah, see yeah. things that you do not see in a normal uh, normal uh, human. You know? Meaning, even for me, before I develop sati, I also not able to see yeah, all yeah, these things, yeah. you know. Okay. Most people uh, without sati, they cannot see the reality and the truth. They normally live in a mundane concept world of knowledge. Uh, then they make use of whatever concept, idea, and knowledge that they have to actually express themselves or talk about Dhamma. Uh, then most of the cultivation is still thought-based. Unless you really see the importance of sati mindfulness leading to heedfulness, then you will venture into the awareness-based meditation, then develop the sati. Then once you develop it, you have a lot of joy, then you progress. That's why for Po Cheng eh, and some of the Kayamita who has done it, they have a lot of understanding and joy. That's why they can explain to you how it can be done. Eh. Yeah, go ahead, Pujeng. Yeah, good. Yeah, first, uh, thank you, Radio and Chan uh, yeah. you know, to the Triple Gem, to Radio, you know, and uh, Bodhisattva Wild Center mm -hmm. develop mm -hmm. that we undertook also. You know? yes. uh, that help, that help me, la, personally speaking, that helped me yeah. a lot. In you benefited the most. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I benefited it and uh, yeah. to, to, uh, uh, own personal experience, or no? Yes, yes. That yes. I can, uh, uh, how say, I, I'm very convinced, or you know, that uh, what Brother Tio taught us is the pure dharma, I mean, the true yeah. dharma, you know? mm -hmm. The awareness based meditation is utmost mm -hmm. important, you know. Uh, with yeah, that, yeah. you can actually uh, see things that you don't see in the normal circumstances, or, okay. Very so, true. back yes. to this, uh, Dhamma in daily life, right? So, uh, mm. so this sati, actually, but you know, this sati is not something that you think about it and you say, uh, I'm aware, you know, it's not like that one. No correct, correct. It's not like That's that. why today's sharing by Jin is very good. Uh, 
uh, you may think yes, you are yes. aware, but actually you are not. Well, yes. most people start yes, with correct, like what correct. Wang Lin went through. They still use a lot of thought. Uh, so oh, when yes, the yes, thought it's, recall, it's not like that, they maybe. think they are aware, but actually they haven't developed the stability or awareness to really be in the state of city or awareness. Because not easy to maintain a stable awareness like I explained. Because to have a stable awareness, your mind must actually transform in a certain way so that it's no longer heedlessly lost in thought. And most of the time it is aware and the stability has to be there. Initially it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody got to start from somewhere like uh, Bing Lin did. Then now, with your sharing, it will help more people. Yeah, okay. Okay. So today, yeah, exactly. But uh, today's sharing, uh, that, uh, you know, talking about uh, you're actually not aware is using the thought to say I'm aware, you know. It, it's not yeah. like that, exactly what the other people mentioned. Uh. Mm. So uh, coming back to this daily life I, that I want to share. So I was... um. Uh, doing my work, you know, at home, uh, yeah. doing my housework. Actually, I was doing, I was doing, so I explained to you what happened uh, mm. in the process of uh, uh, seeing things that I don't normally see. Like, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I'm explaining it in a way that using words, like, you know, so that yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. can uh, no problem. explain yeah. to people, you know, what happened. Yeah, yeah. So I was doing my uh, cooking in the kitchen and also cooking mm. at uh, I was actually cooking the vegetable, you know, I was blanching the vegetable uh, mm. on the stove. And then uh, while doing that, <clears throat> I mean, for me, uh, doing cooking is a very natural way. Like, so so yeah, yeah. Uh, I most of the time, uh, not thinking much, you know, but you know, that's yeah, very yeah. important. You know? For you, much, you, you know? are able to it's, do that because your stability of sati is there and you have developed a lot of understanding of it. That's why you can most of the time aware in the state of without thought. Uh. Yes, yes, correct. So, so, so you you doing your cooking right? So, um, I was uh, removing the vegetable out of the hot water huh? mm. into a plate, lah, right? You okay? Yeah. So I was putting it onto the plate, right? And then, yes. uh, uh, as I want to remove the plate of vegetable from the plate to another location in the kitchen, right? Yeah. I, I use my left, right hand to hold it, like, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And, and it happened that this plate is a metal plate, you know, and I, apparently the plate was hot. So yeah, when I touch yeah. it up, I feel the sudden shock that, I mean, it's not like super shock kind of thing, but there's a shock in my tactile sensation. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tactile so, sensation. Yes. Yeah, it triggered, yeah. it triggered off uh, that, yeah. that it, this sensation, uh, there's this sensation. Correct, right? correct. So, yeah. With that sensation, I put down my plate. You know, right? okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will know what to do straight away. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So after that, right, I look at the, my hand. I see whether there's got any injury. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Or redness and things like that. Lah, right? Correct. Because I feel the sensation. So I felt that, oh, nothing serious. Lah. But anyway, I, I know what to do. You know, in these circumstances, I go into the tap water and rinse it on the running water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, to make sure it cool down like that. Like, in case mm -hmm. that uh, heat, you no, know, onto the, the the skin, you know. Yeah, Usually, yeah, yeah. you have uh, uh, I mean, if you burn your so called not not really burn but when you touch something hot, you may uh, burn your skin, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, But yeah, in yeah. this case, then when I rinse it, there's nothing, nothing serious happen. Uh, nothing lah. No, no, mm. uh, no redness, whatever lah. So, so mm. I said, oh, nothing serious lah. Mm. So I I walk back to the stove right to to continue with my work lah, you know, brother. You know yeah. what? Uh, what happened? Uh, what did I see? You know, suddenly, mm. uh, I could, I could uh, sense uh, the heat energy. You know, uh, the heat energy uh, on my tactile sensation. You know, I can feel yeah, it. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't you can touch, sense uh, it. Yeah. I, never, yeah. uh, I I didn't touch anything. Uh, but I feel it. Wow, the the intensity of the heat. Uh, the yeah, heat yeah, energy. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, it's very like as I go nearer. To the, Stop right, it becomes hotter and hotter and hotter. Although I'm not touching anything, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You will so have the ability the because is... your sati make you sensitive. Yes. Uh, and you can actually zero in yes, because yes, of yes. your ability to be silent. 
then that sati can actually make you sensitive of what happened. Then you can feel all those things that you described, uh, like the heat energy, how it yes, went yes. in and build up and cause all the things inside there. Whereas normal people, they just uh, hurt by the thing only. They, 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 they really uh, develop a lot of what they call thought processing of what happened. But for you, because your mind state is more of the time aware, tranquil, still, then you can have this moment of awareness that allow you to go in and experience. Like what you say, you tend to see things that people normally don't see. That is how awareness makes you different. That ability to be sensitive uh, towards whatever happened, towards all phenomena that arise or happen, whether to you or to nature or to external. All this, they can actually up and on manifest, unfold. Like what I mentioned in the early day, truth is everywhere in the midst of life and nature. Why can't you see? For those who see, they always see. So ability to see means you have city, you have awareness, you are sensitive. Your mind is different. It's not lost in thought, not heedlessly thinking, planning, worrying, and all. Most of the time, it's quiet. That's why it becomes sensitive. Uh, even like that sharing in today's uh, short video sent by Jin Hao. At that time, Sui also shared. He also came to know most people. You are not with your senses most of the time. You are with your thought process, thinking. And that thinking part cloud our sensitivity. That's why it makes us not sensitive. We didn't really make enough use of the senses to actually understand things. Most of the time we use our thought, our knowledge. That is what happened to living beings that don't have city and don't have the Dhamma understanding. They live their life mostly thought-based. They think a lot <laughs> and they dwell with the thought process very constantly. Yeah. Then when you start to see all this, that you are less sensitive and you are involved with the thinking, then you will determine to develop this ability to be aware. Uh, so like what we went through. First, just do. Don't try to know. Develop the awareness. If you do walking, just walk. And the body and mind is one. If you do bowing, just bow. Then if you do the daily mindfulness, just continue to be mindful throughout the day. Whenever the mind runs out, Split second, bring it back, bring it back. It means to be aware until the mindfulness comes. Then all this, whether anapanasati or whatever method technique, when your mindfulness develop and stabilize, you will know. The form of mind will know. Then you know the awareness of whatever object of meditation or whatever you are doing is always there. Uh, then you start to see things differently, then the awareness actually make you uh, like sensitive, make you see things differently, things that you never see before you start to see. Well, most of the time, most people are lost in thought, clouded, no clarity. But once you have clarity, you become sensitive, then you can stay at the sense experience. At the moment of contact, the awareness can be there straight away. And if you want to know, he can know. If you want to release it, he can release it. And if he wants to be in the specific phenomenon aware, he can be. And if he wants to continue to maintain awareness, he can continue to stay at the heart area and have this spacious awareness without a center to continuously develop the awareness to be sensitive and live life. So all this is what cultivation of mindfulness or awareness is. Uh, very good. Okay, Pocheng, you continue. Yeah, what you went through is one of the good example too. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, yes, this, this is precisely what Brother Theo mentioned, you know. <clears throat> so I have this awareness, the, the so-called specific phenomena and awareness, you know, Brother Theo, because I can actually see the uh, the tactile sensation able to detect the energy in the state of change yeah. in the flux, you know, Brother Theo. Yeah, right. mm. So, so it, it, it changes, you know, it changes yeah. as yeah. I go near and then if I go away, it also changes. So I, I am able to do this Dharma Vichaya, Brother Theo, Dharma Vichaya, yeah, investigate you what's going on, what you know. Yeah. Uh, yes, I investigate, it was very interesting in the sense that I can investigate, you know, mm. like uh, if I move around, right, move around, right, so I can sense the, the energy in the state of change and flux, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. intensity is totally different, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. that I can switch it on and switch it off, you know, correct, correct, I, correct. I, when you move your sati, then you can see the difference. Uh, so all yes. this you so, can so keep on. I, I did, yes, yes. At first I didn't know what was happening, but when I realized that I was in the specific phenomena, that's right. So I hmm. actually could do the Dharma with Chaya. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it was very, very true. And, uh, Correct. Yes. Could, uh, when you are in the, the specific the, phenomena the, awareness, then you can do the investigation based on yes, your yes. awareness. Uh, then you start to develop the understanding, just like what I told you all last time. I did the dynamic uh, meditation as uh, initially taught by this long potato, uh, not long potato, sorry, uh, that monk, what, uh, not a monk, that person, what is it? Uh, the dynamic meditation. Uh, he he got a name one. Uh, I forgot his name already. Uh, Achan one. I uh, I forgot his name already. Uh, Long Potien. Ah, uh, Long Potien. Long Potien. Uh, Long Potien. So I met his uh, disciple who was a monk, also a Thai monk, in uh, Praku. He was at Brickfield. Then he wants to learn English, then he happened to be there and I get to know him and he get to know. Then he asked me to help him to do the teaching of the Long Potian technique eh, to Malaysian devotee and asked me to help translate. So I said, okay, no problem. So while I was doing all those helping and translate that, I tried his so-called dynamic meditation, the technique, the long potion technique. Then I realized it can bring my mindfulness to that extent that it become like ever mindful, you know, moment to moment, or you know, the hand movement. You know. Then there was one instant, I remember, there was an itchiness on my forehead. You know. and as my dynamic meditation developed, then I realized uh, I can continue with the awareness uh, until it's like 100% in city, you know, I mean, no gap at all, no. Then suddenly I realize uh, in that state, uh, the sensation, uh, the itchiness, uh, no more, no, it's like the city energy, uh, like cut it off, no? like, like, like that energy uh, went through and that feeling or that sensation of itchiness uh, disappeared. You know? Then I felt, cannot be, how okay, can like that? Then I slowed down the sati, you know, means I don't want to develop the continuous mindfulness to be fully aware, then I like slow it down, means I just let go of the continuous sati. Then I realize that sensation come back in all the which means the aggregate of mind yeah, will return when your sati is not continuous. That's why most people who go through the sati training, they realize they cannot do much with feeling, especially pain or itchiness or all those whatever sensation. You can only develop the ability to endure it when you continuously silence your mind and be with it. Uh, and very few people can do that. Then when I went through that, I 
investigated. I did it two or three times, I remember. And every time I do it, it disappear because of the continuous mindfulness. Then I release it, it come back. Uh, and that was a very good uh, investigative understanding so that I know when I am fully in sati, actually the sensation which is part of the aggregate, they cannot be there. So when you are in mindfulness aware, actually all these sensations, they become like uh, less uh, prominent. Then when you are fully aware, you can actually cut it off. Uh, so all these are the investigative uh, training that one can also do when one has reached that stability. But most of the time, most people do one is different. It's the superficial, initial, like Dhamma investigation. Just like Dhamma Pada verse 1 and 2. So when you are mindful, when you are aware, you realize whenever you get into trouble or entangle yourself with suffering, the evil roots are always there. Uh, I realize initially, whenever I react to sense experience, whenever I like uh, not happy, even for a while, then that mind state actually condition other things. Then you are not peaceful, you are not happy. Uh, but when I accept that reality, be at peace, and no more negativity, uh, then I realize uh, everything falls into place. Or Dhamma Pada was too the twin was take over you know? then happiness follow me like my shadow that you know? then I realize my life transformed you know? that's how I change from a normal uh, reactive type of human being with a lot of duality of like and dislike uh, what they call the mind that always react to sense experience stir and become like uh, unhappy or fearful or worried. You know. I realize all this movement, when I start to develop the understanding of it, to overcome it through understanding, through avoiding Dhammapada verse 1, then I realize when the mind is free of this evils of greed, hatred and delusion, it becomes different you now. It becomes hateful, it becomes aware and it becomes a different mind that is free of the evil roots of greed, hatred, delusion, craving, attachment, clinging, grasping. Means it has the understanding to be with the moment, to come to terms with the reality. The mind does not stir anymore, react to sense experience as before. Then I realized this was the result of the First, second turning wisdom, contemplative wisdom, the initial wisdom, Yoniso Manasikara. Then from there, <coughs> I start to develop more and more understanding. Then the faith comes in because all this investigative uh, training, Dhamma investigation, stand up to investigation, and give me a lot of faith and confidence. Then the virya came. Then I continuously cultivate. Then the sati came. Then everything fall into place. That's how all this understanding manifests and unfold. Then when I come out to share many years later, after 1989, I can explain to you all, all this. And from here, cultivator of the way will develop the understanding. Otherwise, it's not easy. If nobody has gone through the transformative or awakening process, how can you teach? How can you share? No way. Uh, that's why all this sharing is very good. Uh, saying, good, you continue. Yeah, yeah I agree with Brad, you totally. You know, with this, uh, what you say is like uh, if your mind does not stir, yeah. you, you just aware of it and then. Um, you in that you are able to see things as they are, you know. You are mm, not mm, uh, mm. Uh, reacting to anything. You are able to see things differently, and you are able to uh, 
investigate into the dharma and then when you stand up to investigation it gives you a lot of faith your faith becomes yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah, yes. so yeah. uh that that is what can happen when uh we do it correctly like you know in our, mm, mm. uh cultivation you know especially yeah. sati and you know, leading to dharma vichaya you know mm, and then mm. from there I know you you able to penetrate a lot of things that you never see in uh, in a normal average person I know in yeah, yeah, daily yeah. life. So um it is very interesting for me but you know, for this case right I was able to uh in my awareness my right, specific phenomenon awareness for a long time you know, but this this is kind of like surprise to me like you know that Throughout my cooking, uh, I I still able to to have this uh, investigation, you know. Although yeah, I'm yeah. Well, like, yeah, most people I... would have been troubled by what happened. That thing that actually caused the burning sensation, most people were reacted, and uh, 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 reacted in the sense, oh, they 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 like complain like anything. Oh, you stupid of me! I should have. Uh, for you, for those who have the Dhamma, they don't go and think like that anymore. The thought does not proliferate anymore. It's the reality. Well, this is what you experience through Sati. And you are able to be in that state of awareness, to be aware and sensitive. And you can accept that reality because you know there is only one reality. Thing is just the way it conditioned like that, things will be like that. So it so happened, you use your hand to try to lift up that plate of thing. And the moment you touch it, it's still hot and it's metal, that instantaneous tactile sensation will come. But at the moment of sense experience, because you have the Dhamma and understanding, you become different. That's why you do what you have to do. You need to rinse with the water and all that. You thought it was okay. Then after that, you go back. When you go back, you realize your awareness is able to be aware of all those sensations and all those things. Then you realize how the heat builds up and how the tactile and all those things. Means as a human being, how the consciousness of this tactile sensation actually manifests and how through the heat energy it causes all those movements. That is like you can investigate into it, you can develop the movement of specific phenomenal awareness to investigate into it and to develop the under all these are very beautiful understanding and sharing because many people not only many, I think a lot of cultivate all the way, they don't go to that depth or that level of understanding of what the tea is. To them it's all the theoretical dhamma and the uh, interesting what they call uh, discussion that is normally discussed to me is very theoretical uh, not dhamma in daily life where it touches on every aspect of our life even such thing as doing the kitchen work of kitchen chores uh. is it chores or kyo? chore <laughs> Uh, like what you do. Uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> you experience all this and there is Dhamma inside. That's why I say Dhamma is everywhere in the midst of life and nature. Why can't you see? For those who see, they always see. So these are all the beautiful understanding that can unfold. Yeah, right. so, with, yeah so with that, right, you, you have a lot of uh, joy, you know, and, uh, uh, peacefulness of mind that you are able to investigate and see things as they are right and yes. then um, where normal and, people and don't see and don't experience that's how you yeah. become sensitive you become different and through the understanding you will develop better and better understanding of life of phenomena of what happened what is the activity and movement that are involved in a mind that has the Dharma and the mind before you have the Dharma. That's why I, in the early days, I remember, I remind the Panikayamita, when the transformation starts, make sure you 
develop the mindfulness to observe and see all the because during that time very interesting I remember I can compare you know, before the mind transform and after the mind transform but that phase for me it happened over about nine months only. then that nine months a lot of things happened you know. <coughs> then after that then my Monday my collapse uh, I actually technically cannot go back to the old way. Well, my Monday mind no more, no? gone already. Uh, but through my contemplative wisdom and understanding and recollection and what happened before that, the nine months prior to that, I actually developed a lot of understanding. And that time, I, like I said, I want to write it down, but too much thing to write. No point. Actually, initially, I make some notes, I remember. Then later on, I just tell myself, forget about it, no point. If it's meant to be, it will be. That's why I need causes and conditions for me to recall, recollect. And then I can share. Uh, then some of this that happened in the past, I can actually recollect. Then from there, I can share the understanding in the Dhamma but I went through it. My nature went through it. And this is how cultivator of the way who have the understanding when they share is based on direct seeing, direct awakening, direct knowledge and vision of the reality of what happened. It's not from knowledge that they heard from people or read from other books or uh, learning from others and other, not not that type of thought based on. So all these are very uh, beautiful, wonderful, and amazing when the cultivator of the way really move into it and develop all this understanding. Mm. So very interesting. Huh? Yeah, yes, yes, very interesting. So the other thing I want to mention, Raja, is the. Uh, the mind is a free mind, no? without. Yeah. It's not a conditioned uh, mind state. Correct. Very so, true. Yeah. It's yes. a free mind. Uh. Yes. It's not in concentration or whatever. Yeah. You know? It's a free mind. Uh. Yeah. So, in so, awareness, that's it. Uh. Yes, correct. So it's in awareness. It's a free mind. You, you yeah. continue to do your daily work. There's no change. Correct. To it, uh. you know? Uh, you know the speed of your work is not like slow down. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's just normal. Everything you know? it's is just, just normal, happening you know? at the normal pace of life. Uh, yes, it's correct, not like correct. those who make use of a conditioned mind uh, through their what they call samatha meditation uh, or continuous mindfulness or what they call concentration uh, in jhana. Those people they use that mind that is in that state to see but that one is a conditioned state it's not a free mind so that one the hindrance are all suppressed and they cannot learn because without the hindrance you cannot learn but there is no mental hindrance to hinder them and they are always in that peace that calmness and all that but they cannot see things as they are where all these are Condition state that the mind cannot move to manifest all those reality. So what they see is actually a condition state of transformed mind state. That's why they can also have very deep concentration, or they call it uh, energy field that make them very calm, very peaceful. Like they have no thought no, but. All their thought are killed into one point you know, or in that state of concentration or absorption that prevent the arising of thought. Yeah. So that is the big difference. The one is D is a free mind. The mind is not a conditioned mind. Yeah. Not conditioned by anything to be peaceful, to be calm, to be in a state of concentration or something. No, it's a free mind. And yet away unwavering, uh, tranquil, still. So that free mind in that state is our true mind. And that one is not a mind state caused by what we call 
mundane mental conditioning. That is the big difference. That's why the awareness-based meditation and the thought-based, they are very different, world apart. And the result that come out of it is completely different. Thought-based is a different set of training. It's still within the field of thought. And whatever you do, very difficult for one to liberate from the thought base. Finally, they have to release the concentration out and go into the daily mindfulness to develop the stability of sati and awareness and come back to the free mind state to actually live life and develop the wisdom and understanding. Yeah. That's why the sati, mindfulness, sati patana, the four foundation of mindfulness, is very important and the Buddha mentioned it very clearly. Ekayano vikawe beko, o beko. This is the only way for the purification of mind, for the overcoming of sorrow and grief, leading to the enlightenment or awakening, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. That's why all these are shared in the four foundation of mindfulness teaching. So without sati leading to stability of mindfulness, to cultivate the four foundation of mindfulness, there is no way one can develop awakening beyond the uh, first and second sainthood way. To realize anagamiship and arahanship, you need to cultivate the four foundation of mindfulness as per the Avijja Sutta that we have shared and discussed before. So all these, they are in line and consistent with the teaching. Hmm. So it's good that Pucheng, you are able to catch it that it's a free mind, not a conditioned mind. Hmm. Good. Yeah. Yeah, because gradual, I'm in the midst of life doing work. Yeah, I'm not yeah. like sitting there, concentrating my mind, focusing, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. To, to fill up my energy, you know, to to, to see things, you know. So mm. in the midst of life, uh, you experience it at the moment of uh, sense experience, is it? And uh, mm. that is the yes. most wonderful experience yeah, using the yeah. awareness-based meditation that Brother Pio taught us. Uh, that's most yeah, important, yeah. I think, you know. Uh, yes, without yes. that, I will not be able to see what I can see, you know, as well. Yeah, yeah. So this awareness-based meditation, uh, I can't emphasize the importance uh, of it. I hope that you so important for cultivation. Mm. With that, you can see uh, a lot more things that a normal human being cannot see, you know. Yeah, very so, true. Uh, yes, yes. Very true. so it, I mean, for me, look, using that awareness-based meditation, I'm right, able to like develop the sati, I'm able to have the uh, tranquility of mind, the samadhi, you know, that collective mm -hmm. mind, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. then from there, I can develop understanding, you know, what I yeah, see, yeah, you know. Yeah. That's most beautiful, Brazil, and amazing yeah, yeah. for me, like, you know, personal experience like that, you know, that mm. you cannot buy, you know, with money, you know. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cannot buy this with money, you know. This is true. Uh, our uh, understanding uh, and uh, cultivation, you know, mm. we properly, you know, through a uh, experienced teacher, the teacher that know, a wise teacher that know how to teach the true dharma to the students, yeah. you know, mm. that is so important, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Sadhu. Yeah, very yeah. 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 actually. Yeah, yeah. cannot. Words cannot describe the, the, the gratitude towards Varapio and the respect of Varapio that taught so much valuable things to me, you know. As mm. a cultivator, Sadi, a treasure yeah. is more, so much, it's like a yeah. gem. Also, that, your good past, your good coming yeah. inheritance, and your condition uh, yeah. that so it, actually so enable like all this to be possible. Yeah. That's why <coughs> the individual path to awakening or cultivation depend on our sincerity, our faith, and our what they call uh, perseverance, and also our karmic past. 
uh, what we did and our affinity with Triple Gem. So all this, they will play a role. That's why not only your his project, uh, many other Kayamita too, they have their own uh, condition from the past that enable them to this life having the causes and condition to actually encounter the true teaching then through their own faith and understanding and past causes and conditions everything will happen then it will start to unfold, manifest and they just know what to do and the progress will happen and it will transform them and when they transform in fact most Kayamita in one way or other they benefited in many ways their life have changed, transformed various dependent on the individual based on the various degree of understanding and transformation and many of them the last two three years have made very good progress yeah. that's why manager rejoice and the Kayamita force is developing and getting stronger and stronger and is going to move more and more Kayamita yeah. That's why I also hinted to you with this second round of sharing of the Heart Sutta class, if Kayamita pay attention, listen to it attentively and develop the understanding, by the time yeah, we go for the next retreat, which is this coming end of August, yeah, they will progress and most of them will become very different. What you need to do now is to develop the faith, the understanding, then with sincerity persevere to train your mind to be mindful. Most Ayamita who has not developed the stability of mindfulness, stabilize it, then develop it until the mindfulness comes. Means you are the awareness itself, the body and mind has become one. Means sati, awareness, and all your activity in life, the daily mindfulness, whether you do it through daily mindfulness, daily activity, or bowing, or anapanasati, or any of your mind state, even the four uh, support, stabilize it. Uh, then every day have a good religious routine yeah? like what you did yeah? and Alicia and many Kayamita did means every morning when you wake up maintain awareness determined to be aware then do your uh, daily religious routine means you pay respect then you want to meditate for a while then share merit, transfer merit then after that you wash up, then when you are ready, come down to your bodhisattva vow, then you want to meditate for a while, you can. Then in the afternoon, when you have time, silence your mind, develop the, what they call, uh, awareness, stability, through your formal meditation, or your daily religious routine, you just uh, read the metta, then after that meditate for a while, then contemplate, reflect, then share, marry, and transfer. So every session, morning, maybe 20 minutes or maximum 30 minutes. Then some who are good in the afternoon when you have time, especially your lunch break or when you free, you sit for half an hour to 30 minutes or lie down yeah, and train your mind. Then in between, develop daily mindfulness, determined to be aware, everything you do, aware, aware. Then at night, before you sleep, do the same, that routine. Yeah. Then after that, you will sleep peacefully, you will sleep well. Yeah. Then if you do this over a period of six months, I guarantee you, you become very different. Then if you take the Bodhisattva vow yeah, regularly, means at least once a day, every day. Then that one will become a part of you. Then you are like throughout the day in the month. Yeah. I remember during the year 1986 until 89, non-stop I cultivate, even at home, 
at the office, come back or whatever. Throughout the day, I determine to be away and I have my religious routine. And I make it a point every day when I wake up, I pay respect, I do my routine. Then before I leave my house, I pay respect. I go to the temple, the first thing I do is pay respect, silent myself, then read it and transform my relation. Then after that, I will walk around and then observe and do what I have to do. Then if there is any Dharma activity at the temple area, I will join in. Or if not, let's say Friday night there is a Dharma talk, or Sunday there is a, a Sunday school and all those things, then there is a Dharma talk too. So normally I will go with my wife, with my children, then we send them to the Sunday school, we do our routine, then we join the Sunday talk. Then after that, we observe, we do the daily mindfulness, then we do some sharing when we meet up with Dharma friends or Kaya meters. Yeah. So all this, if you do it well, until all this stabilize, then you will know what happened. The individual will know what happened. Then you become so different. No? Uh, and because I did it over that two over to three years, that's why the transformation, the understanding, they become very stable. Because as I move into the, the, the cultivation, the practice, and the routine, I develop a type of momentum that make me interested in Dhamma. Throughout the day, I am actually in that state of cultivation. Then, non-stop, I will contemplate, reflect. Then even while I'm working, I develop mindfulness, awareness. And when I need to do my work at a meeting or what, I maintain mindfulness, awareness. And with that, I realize the transformation become very fast. And a lot of things just happen. That's why that two over to three years was fantastic. Uh, and also maybe because that was the timing, the message came from Kuan Yin that I need to move fast, not much time left. That's why I determined from there on to develop the cultivation and the understanding. And that really came to the more or less pinnacle of it when I realized the cessation in the year 1989. Uh, actually beginning of the year, not the end of the year 89. Uh, actually end of 88, I more or less had the understanding right? But the actual cessation and connection come in 89. Uh, then after that I left, I met my last guy. Uh, and that's the rest is history. So all this is what is important and must be developed by those who want to progress. Uh, the daily religious routine, uh, stability or sati, do it uh, until it become a part of you, uh, until the thing manifests. And then you become very different on, on your own, like the Buddha said, you no need to confirm with anybody. Right? You will know what this thing is. Right? Because the Dhamma is Pachetang, can be realized by the wise Ishwar himself. And inside the nature, the form and mind that went through the transformation and realization and the cessation will know it very clearly. Right? It is not the usual one, not thought based, <laughs> not the knowledge that is the internal awakening and transformation and you cannot actually express it out in word one initially because the stability is not there yet but there is a lot of joy there's a lot of joy then the understanding inside uh, is so different then i like to continuously contemplate reflect and develop the understanding that's why all those things that i did Later on become my understanding with the stability for me to share with you all. So all those unique code or whatever, actually they come about through all those contemplative wisdom, the third turning wisdom, the 
training, the cultivation, and the contemplation, especially I contemplated a lot that time. Then all the realization, the six sandal, the teacher, Samuppada, Dipanoy, and all the secret online, everything that I share and uh, uh, unfold to share with you all, they are all from that two over to three years of cultivation, contemplation, and awakening. So all this, hopefully, it can give rise to faith to most kaya nita. Okay, I think we need to end soon. Huh? Uh, po Cheng, you want to summarize? Oh, almost okay, for, one okay, minute. First, yeah. first <coughs> and foremost, uh, Mahasadhi, to gratitude you for your amazing cultivation that Mm. Uh, enable uh, cultivators of the way like us for serious you know, cultivation to you know cultivate correctly you know and then um uh, able to witness all the dharma unfolding and manifest mm. and mm. especially good uh, I mean initially when I first started doing uh, learning from her, the, the 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 all the teachings on the contemplation. The, uh, first turning, second turning, right? Mm, uh, it's yeah. useful, you know, that very useful. Yeah, yeah, they are like very I, useful. I actually find uh, very beneficial, you know. It, it kind of mm. cut short my training, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really yeah. cut short my training, you know. Mm. So I am most uh, grateful to Brother Tiola, and I think all Kayamitas also uh, feel the same, you know. So very grateful to Brother Tio and has most respect to Brother Tio for such a wonderful, amazing teaching. Uh, and of course, uh, we need to thank and uh, pay our respect and gratitude to, towards all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and yeah, Mahasattvas yeah, yeah, in the same yeah, direction yeah. for their blessings, protections, and guidance, you know, and support mm, mm. Uh, for this fragile body, you know, mm, uh, yeah, to continue yeah, yeah. to cultivate, you know, <laughs> mm. for the longest time that we can, uh, you know, so sadu, that we can sadu, make good. push. Make full use of our time, you know, on yeah, earth yeah. Uh, as a human While being. On know, this earth, learning yeah. from that, you know, hopefully, that you uh, will keep yourself healthy and continue to teach. Uh, thank uh, you, thank you, Sadio. Yes, yeah. and of course, we, we hope that you will, will, will have a healthy life, you know, to continue to teach and help uh, all sentient beings as much as possible to awaken them. Uh, uh, sadu, mm. to sadu, 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 sadu. Amitopo. Okay, Amitopo. Let us rejoice. Huh? Sadu, sadu, sadu. Okay, we will do the sharing of Maris and transfer Maris. Then we end. Aka Sata Chia Bumata Deva Naga Mahindika Punyang Tang Anamodito Chirang Rakantu Loka Sasana Itta Wata Chamehi Sampadan Punya Sampadan Sabe deva anumo dantu Sabe sampati sidia Idang menya tidang hotu Sugita hontunya teyo Idang menya tidang hotu Sugita hontunya teyo Idang menya tidang hotu Sugita hontunya teyo Deo wasatu kalena Sasa sampati he to cha, fi to bawa tu lo ko cha, raja bawa tu dami ko, emina punyang kamina, mame bala sama gamo, satang sama gamo ho tu, ya wa niva na patia, sadu. Sadhu, Sadhu. Okay, we all can now pay respect mindfully to Lord Buddha, Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, and all the worthy ones. Then we end. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu.